Hello, it's good to have you join with us. We're going to begin with a hymn, quite an old hymn written by Joseph Addison. It's sung by a massed choir of Indian Christians. They sing it with real vitality. And the hymn is based on the first half of Psalm 19. Psalm 19 is in two parts in which the psalmist presents us with two books that tell God's story. The first book is the book of creation which we can read as we appreciate the majesty of the world God has made around us. The second book is God's word to us, which we can listen to, that speaks to us of God's concern for us. The psalmist begins, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. So let us begin to worship God with the spacious firmament.
Now join with me in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pause and in the stillness and quiet we reflect that you are God. And even to step outside and look up into the heavens or around about us at all that your hand has made, we were to listen to the sounds of the world or the silence of the lateness of the hour. Our hearts still reach out for you, for you have planted eternity in them. And as we have come to you in faith in Jesus Christ, you have poured out your love in our hearts, creating in us that yearning that we might know you more. And we rejoice, Lord God, that you have given us ways to know you. You have created us in your image so that we, as we look at your world, may perceive the hand of our Creator in all that has been made. We may see your footprints on creation, your finger marks in all that there is. But much more you have spoken to us through the apostles and the prophets, declaring your ways with us, giving us sufficient that we might know you and love you and serve you. But above all, your final word to us is not in the beauty of that which is created, nor in the detail of that which you have declared, but in the word made flesh, your eternal Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who took human flesh, who became like us, one of us, sharing in all our experiences, that he might save us from our sin. For we confess, Lord God, we are sinners. We acknowledge there are things we do which hurt others and are, and are offensive to you. We have crossed those boundaries that you set for our own good. We have left undone all sorts of good things we might have done. We can only deceive ourselves in believing that we are without sin. But as we confess our sins, you are just, and you are faithful to your word, and you forgive us our sins, because their penalty and price was paid by Jesus on the cross. But more than that, you have in him given us newness of life. In raising him from the dead, you have given us the hope of eternal life. And you have poured out your spirit that we might more ably understand your word to us. We may more faithfully serve you in our daily living. So come to us, Lord God, we pray. Speak to us and give us ears that hear and lives that glorify. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have just one reading. It's carrying on looking at the book of Acts. We're in chapter 20 and at verse 13. And we read from there. Luke begins uh, by pointing out subtly that he's there with the other companions of Paul. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Assos, we took him aboard and went on to Mytilene. 
The next day we set sail from there and arrived at Chios. The day after we crossed over to Samos, and on the following day arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you but that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with them all and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. We thank God for his word and pray that he'll help us to understand it. Alone, who took on flesh, 
are the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the depth of Christ I live. My darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's cause has lost its grip on me. Last week we were with Paul in Troas and we looked at some of the features of life in the early church that we can infer from the account of the service at Troas. Now we've moved on to Miletus and Paul's meeting with the elders from Ephesus and there is a little more direct teaching from Paul about his ministry and the responsibility of the elders of the church at Ephesus. To give something of a framework uh, to our study of this passage, I want to focus on a word that keeps coming up in one form or another. It's the word no. It's about what the overseers from Ephesus knew and about what Paul knew. So, first of all, three things that the elders at Ephesus knew. First, the elders knew about Paul's lifestyle. Verse 19, when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. For Paul, the way a Christian leader, especially but any Christian, but the way a Christian leader lives was supremely important. He, he's willing to risk the charge of immodesty by citing features of his own lifestyle to emphasize this. He lived, he says, a humble lifestyle. That's in verse 19. And it was an emotionally costly business for him. That's verse 19. And again in verse 31, there were times when he was moved to tears as he reflected on the seriousness of the message he had and the response of his hearers to that message. There's no way that you can regard uh, what Paul thought of his work as being just a job. In his second letter to the Corinthians, after there'd been a bit of serious self-examination prompted by his first letter, Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You know that you are a letter from Christ, 
the result of our ministry, written not with ink but with the Spirit on, of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of human hearts. That the daily challenge was twofold. When people look at us, they are to read Christ in us. And we must live in a way such that we can say, imitate me. That was the standard Paul set. Towards the end of the first letter to the Corinthians, he writes this, 1 Corinthians 10. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the Church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be served. Follow my example, as I follow the example of Christ. You see, this, this lifestyle had to reflect the discipleship of Paul, as it does any believer, writing to the Philippians, chapter 3, verse 17, he says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just, if you, just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Incidentally, this explains why, one of the reasons why it's important to have a diverse church in terms of class and age and experience because then there are so many different role models. If you have a church where everyone is of a certain age or a certain social background or, or whatever similarity, it's not a challenging church. It's just a load of people who all agree with each other. So here is the importance of example and Paul says to the Ephesian elders, you know I lived consistently. Secondly, the Ephesian elders knew about Paul's preaching. Verses 20 and 21. You know that I've not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but I've taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And then again at verse 26, Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Now, it's only a few verses, but Paul says so much about his preaching ministry there. He says it was comprehensive. I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you. It was both public and it was domestic. I have taught you publicly and from house to house, he says. It was to everyone the same ministry I have declared to both Jews and Greeks. It was preaching that calls for repentance. They must turn to God in repentance. It was Christ-centred. Have faith in our Lord Jesus. It was extensive. I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Now, like any preacher listening to God's words, these words are for me a personal challenge. It is so easy to soft pedal difficult topics. It's great to say that God loves you and to say how much he loves you. But it's more difficult to say to nice people that they actually don't deserve God's love. And in reality, are due God's wrath and judgment. And so it's not easy to spell out the need for repentance, a complete turnaround, an abandonment of cherished sins. It is easy 
to avoid the difficult passages and so not proclaim the whole counsel of God. But the elders knew that this was how Paul preached. Thirdly, the elders from Ephesus knew how the ministry they benefited from was financed. In verses 33 and 34, I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. We are rather used in the UK and particularly in the older denominations like the Church of Scotland to accept that there should be a paid ministry. Ministers are given not a salary but a stipend. It is in a way the church saying look we want you to minister to us we want you to teach us we want you to be examples to us we want you to give us pastoral care and so that you aren't worrying about your heating bill or where the next meal is coming from we give you a stipend so you can concentrate on the ministry you have been entrusted with in other places and at other times Paul's template was the one that was followed and still is followed. There's a jargon phrase, bivocational ministry. Or sometimes people call it, like Paul or after Paul, a tent-making ministry. So there are two biblical patterns for ministry. The, the one is what Paul did to the Ephesians he was no burden at all, but he financed not only his own, but others' ministry amongst them. And he did that by working. The other pattern is the pattern of setting aside money for ministry. And both these patterns are biblical. And that kind of illustrates what I've been saying over and over again of the danger of reading a passage and trying to draw the right way of doing things out of that. You see, Paul conducted his ministry at Ephesus at his own expense. But Timothy, bishop of Ephesus, did not do that. He was expect, it was expected that he would be financed. So these are the three things Paul says that the Ephesians knew about him, about his lifestyle, about his preaching, and about how his ministry was financed. And so now we move on to the three things that Paul knew. Well, the first is a bit sort of upside down. He knew what he didn't know. Acts chapter 20 at verse 22. And now... Compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. There is woven into our being a, a, an almost obsessive desire to want to know what's going to happen in the future. You see that in these silly things like horoscopes that people look at. You, you see it in, in fortune telling and prediction. You even see it in something that gets called in some Christian circles prophecy, but which I would say very boldly is not such. We devote so much of our energy wanting to try and work out by our understanding or we look for some sort of sign that will tell us the Apostle Paul, chosen by God to have one of the most significant missions in the history of the church, did not know what the future held. And he said he did not know. What he said was he did know it was going to be tough. Now that was hardly a special revelation he'd had. 
There'd hardly been anywhere where it hadn't been tough. And actually, it would have been a bit dim of Paul if he didn't expect hardships. But he was going into the future, living by faith, not by sight. You see, there is something quite faithless in wanting to have the future mapped out for you or revealed to you. Secondly, Paul knew he would not see the Ephesians again. Verse 25, Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. There are two contrasting reactions to this. From the elders of Ephesus, this is just great sadness. Paul and they have been through a great deal together. They've established and built up a significant church. It had been costly and demanding. But like any where people have laboured together, especially where they've laboured for the gospel, it's sad to be told that this is it. We're not going to meet again. They loved Paul and they were heartbroken at the thought of this separation forever. But Paul had his thoughts on something else. He knew that if the work had to be established, had to be continued, had to grow and flourish, there also had to be a good and godly company of spiritually minded men who would carry on that work. And so he says to them at verse 28, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. The Ephesians were looking back over the past. Paul was looking forward to the future and he urged these men to keep watch on themselves. Remember, the aim is that the younger, less mature Christians should be able to imitate them and to keep watch over the flock. There is here one reason for diligent pastoral oversight of elders in a church. The flock of God was bought by the Good Shepherd's blood no greater payment could have been made. With that comes a call not to manage or to rule or to domineer over the church, but to be a shepherd. Christ gave his life for these people and it's the calling of these elders to look after them. Because, and that brings us on to the third thing Paul knows, he knows the perpetual danger the church is in. Verse 29, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Be on your guard. The battle for a congregation to preserve a good testimony is always being fought on two fronts. On the one hand, there are those from outside who want to bring the church down. Only they seldom say that. They say they want to bring it up, up to date. It needs to abandon some of its more difficult, old-fashioned doctrines. It needs to be more appealing. It needs to use methods which will attract people in. You can't just have people sitting listening to a preacher. That's boring. They come from outside. They say, look at us. 
We, we, we enjoy life. We want you to be more flexible so that you could be like us and that would attract so many people. They have beaming faces and a happy smile and it all seems so positive. And they're a big danger. We have to listen, examine what they're actually saying when they come to us. But there is the same danger from inside. Those who are amongst the flock, but who are actually wolves. And so it's the clear responsibility for the elders to be on their guard. And when people propound false teaching, when they would lead the congregation away with strange ideas, that is to be challenged. It's not just to be allowed, it's not just to say, oh, we all basically believe the same thing. If we don't, it needs to be called out. One writer on this passage notes that when Paul and the Ephesian elders went their separate ways, they were weeping. But they wept for different reasons. The elders wept because they wouldn't see their friend again. Their friend wept because he knew that enemies of the gospel would try to sneak in and corrupt the church. And so with these words, there is the parting. What can you do at this stage of things? What does Paul do? Verse 32. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. In other words, he commits them to the gospel. The gospel is the word of God's grace. The gospel can build us up. The gospel gives us an inheritance we can look forward to with the other saints. And it does this for all who are sanctified, who have heard God's call and responded in faith to Jesus Christ. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And so we go our separate ways.
As always, we're grateful to Sue and Jim for their contribution and, of course, for the lovely photographs and videos that accompany the songs. We turn to God in prayer now. We have a new president to the United States and whatever you think of the man or of the nation, this is a very significant appointment after a somewhat troubled time in that country. So we will be thinking of that as we will think of our own country and its needs at this time. So join with me in prayer. Let us pray. Lord our God, we thank you that you are sovereign. You are Lord of all lords, King of all kings, ruler of all rulers. There is not a thing happens in this whole world but by your permissive will you give over people to their own devices that they might learn their errors but you also uphold those who commit themselves to you and you give your own wisdom and strength that they might do what is your will in the world and so we come to you and we pray for the world and especially we pray for Joe Biden that he at this late stage of his life as he accomplishes what he has sought to do for so long may humbly seek from you the wisdom to know and the strength to do what is pleasing to you and what we pray for him we pray for our own nation, for our own leaders, that their hearts and our hearts together may be turned back to you, the living God. Teach us, Heavenly Father, in our public life to walk in your ways. Make us good citizens for Jesus' sake. We pray for that the church in Scotland for church leaders who reflect on the continuing restrictions on public worship we ask that they may know the right way to deal with this we pray for our own congregations for our own elders that as they seek to be good shepherds under the great shepherd of the flock they may have a sensitivity to all the different needs we pray that as a church we may at one and the same time give you thanks for the skills of scientists their understanding and all that has produced not just one but several vaccines but we pray that we may continue to declare that the hope for the humankind is not in a vial containing a vaccine but in the Lord Jesus Christ himself and to that end we ask that we may have freedom to speak your word when so many issues of contention, political issues, issues to do with gender and race and history are up for grabs. We ask that the media, particularly social media, may be so structured and governed and regulated that the freedom of speech may be preserved, but protection from injury 
will also be provided. We pray for all who are setting out into a week conscious of the challenges before them, be it the challenge of being president of the most significant country in the world or the challenge of knowing what to do about one's domestic circumstances or one's workload. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that no matter how great or how small the issues are, we can lay them before you. Lord, hear our prayers. We thank you that as we bring people on our hearts before you in prayer, we can, in the quiet, name them to you. as we name them we pray that you in your grace and mercy and out of your tender love for them would stretch out your hand and touch them we thank you for all those people who have gone before us who now rejoice in your nearer presence we ask that you'd comfort those who miss them Help them to make the adjustments and give us all that aspiration to fix our eyes on Jesus so that when our days come to an end we may enter through faith in him into that great kingdom of peace and joy and light. So hear all our prayers as we bring them in Jesus' name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. In the past, I've introduced you to one or two of the questions in the so-called Heidelberg Catechism, one of the great reformed catechisms of the church. A lot of catechisms don't say much uh, about evangelism. But evangelism has been very much the theme as we've gone through Acts, the sharing of the gospel. The Heidelberg Catechism does, actually, and it does say something which would chime with what we've been learning about Paul's uh, ministry himself amongst the Ephesians. This is question 86. Since we have been delivered from our misery by grace alone through Christ, without any merit of our own, why must we yet do good works? Ah, that's a good question, isn't it? It, it? it says, we know that this is the gospel, that, that we're delivered from God's judgment by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. It's not anything that we have done that makes us acceptable to God. It's what God has done before in Jesus Christ on our behalf. So why do we have to do good works? And here's the answer. Because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, also renews us by his Holy Spirit to be his image so that our whole life may show ourselves thankful to God for his benefits and he be praised by us. Further, we ourselves may be assured of our faith by its fruits and that our godly walk of life may win our neighbours for Christ. See what the answer's saying there? It's saying, yes, it's true that Christ has redeemed us by his blood. That, that's, that's fantastic. 
that, that is that is so good that we don't have to scrape our insides out trying to be pure and to be acceptable. We are accepted because of what God has done in Christ. But God also in the gospel renews us by his spirit and he renews us into his image. In other words, it's what Paul was saying. Our whole lives should reflect our gratitude to God. Our whole lives should show that we know we are what we are by the grace of God. And that has two effects. One is it assures us of our faith by its fruits. In other words, if we lead a godly life, that assures us that we are walking in step with Christ. But also, the Catechism says, we may win our neighbours for Christ. What does it make you tick? Why are you different? Christianity is always countercultural. It always involves people swimming against the tide. And if we swim against the tide in true godliness and Christ-likeness, then one day someone will say to us, why do you believe this? Now you might say, I couldn't, I couldn't do a Paul and explain. You couldn't, okay? I'll accept that's maybe true, maybe not true, but I'll accept that. But what you can do is say, Come and listen to God's word being preached. And that will help you understand what this is all about. Till we meet again, may God's grace, mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you. And we sing of that great kingdom that we belong to in Jesus Christ. The singers are the congregation of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, glorious things of the earth spoken, Zion, city of our God.